And we're going to uh, move into that straight away. Ron Glatter, um, uh, another um, eminent uh, Belmas uh, stalwart, uh, who is uh, one of our vice presidents. Uh, I, I think most of you will know Ron, but uh, uh, a professor in educational <coughs> management and administration leadership. I can't remember what they changed the name to for you, Ron, uh, at the Open University. But um, uh, very um, uh, prolific in uh, engaging uh, very positively and effectively uh, with the media as well as um, academics and uh, much respected by colleagues in local education authorities for the work he did uh, on LEAs. Um, Ron, uh, it's your moment. Uh, very warm welcome. <laughs> Thank you very much, David. Um, this presentation is going to be very closely linked to the paper I wrote in the 40th anniversary issue of email. So if you've read that, you've got two choices. You know, you either use this in order to bring it back to mind, or you go to sleep, or go out, or do something else. Um, but I thought I'd, I'd warn you about that. And also, I am going to be talking fairly fast, because I'm worried about the cracknell axe. Um, so hopefully it won't fall uh, too soon. Um, so there we are. Now, um, the, the basis of this uh, particular paper was that um, I had remembered um, uh, when the 2010 white paper uh, came out, uh, and there was a big theme in that white paper um, about autonomy and accountability, and how, as it says here, the strongest systems combine autonomy with accountability. And that was a theme running through a lot of the, a lot of the paper, and that was going to be the new vision. This was November uh, 2010. Um, and, and I remembered that there was, in 1975, that um, BEAS, which is what it was called, as David said earlier, at that time, British Education and Administration Society, uh, ran its fourth annual conference, uh, and that conference, in fact, had a theme of autonomy and accountability in educational administration. Um, and so I wondered, well, is it a case of the more things change? And I'll come back to that later on. Um, and the late Meredith Hughes, who uh, went on, of course, professor at uh, Birmingham University, and then went on to be chair of... Uh, of this society and uh, also president of the Commonwealth Council. He and John Richards um, produced proceedings of the conference because at that time we did have proceedings. We had proceedings of each annual conference because the conference had a much more linear style then and it was much easier to do proceedings. You couldn't do that now, I don't think. Uh, there, were n there were no members' papers. It was very largely keynotes, very largely plenaries, not entirely, but very largely. So it was possible to do proceedings. Um, and one of the uh, points made in, in that particular set of proceedings, and I'm very grateful to Richard, by the way, for digging it out, uh, digging, digging those proceedings out for me. Um, uh, it said, our concern has been with accountability and autonomy, concepts which need to be better understood in relation to each other, having regard to specific organizational settings. And, and looking back over the years, it did seem to me that those last uh, six words were extremely important, uh, and I'm going to come back to them sh uh, at the end. Uh, right, I'm going to let you visit the 1975 annual conference uh, of uh, the BEAS for a few minutes. So just imagine you're there now, um, and your first speaker, actually, um, is going to strongly put the case for local corporate management. Now, those of you who are far too young to know what corporate management is, which looks like the, the vast majority of people here, um, I think David might just about remember it. <laughs> um, it was all about a much more centralised approach to decision-making in local authorities. Um, I know Peter, for example, will remember it well. Um, and um, it was all about uh, thinking about uh, other services and making sure that it wasn't just education, which was the biggest service by far previously, uh, got the, you know, attention in terms of resources, but it also shifted power significantly, or potentially shifted power significantly, to chief executives, to council leaders, and so on, and away from uh, education officers. So that was a, it was a big, uh, big issue uh, at that particular point in time. And the advocate for that at that particular conference was a gentleman called John Boynton, chief executive 
have guessed what? Cheshire County Council. Um, and David will, I'm sure, uh, well, very familiar with that authority in more recent years. Um, but John Boynton was a, was a key figure. Uh, and he, he, he argued the case for corporate management. And he also um, uh, made a point that I guess most people would actually agree with, completely uncontentious, I would have thought, uh, but perhaps difficult in the current climate, a strong and vigorous local government is a good cornerstone for any truly democratic system. Um, and he, went, he then talked about the role of other services, and he gave an example. If we're in for a time of recession, then we cannot afford to run down the forces of law and order. There may be unemployed roaming the streets. Um, so <laughs> there are some interesting connections, perhaps, with, uh, with uh, more recent times there. Uh, I didn't make that last quote up, by the way. It's actually in the proceedings, in case you thought I might have done. Um, then we had a contribution now, just a picture, you know, we're, we're going very quickly, but you're still in the 1975 conference. Uh, the next speaker was another, uh, was Alan Barnes, who sadly is no longer with us. Um, he was president of uh, the Headmasters Association, uh, which later became, of course, the Secondary Heads Association, now Association of uh, college, uh, uh, School and College Leaders. And he also later became chair of BMAS, which is what it had become by the early 80s. And there were three points that I pulled out of his contribution that seemed to me to be significant. Um, one was that he thought that corporate management interfered very much with professional decisions and therefore was uh, quite worrying from the point of view of the education service. Secondly, uh, that he obviously the start of, of assessment, had, you know, serious assessment of performance had just started to come in. Assessing performance of schools or teachers, uh, he thought, was a subtle business and it was really very important that it shouldn't be mechanistic. Um, and then thirdly, um, he actually wanted education to be out of local government um, and he gave two possible routes to go, either more central direction with minimum standards uh, or, if that was thought to be too dangerous, uh, to have separate local education boards somewhat along the lines of the school board system in the United States. So that was, uh, that was Alan, uh, as I say, sadly no longer with us. Uh, and another person who's also sadly no longer with us uh, was the next speaker, um, who was uh, Professor Maurice Cogan. Um, who was a professor for a, a long period of time at Bruno University, um, head of the Department of Government Studies and Law. And he had been previously, as a Mandarin, he had actually been uh, in, uh, uh, in the DES, the Department for Education and Science, and he was actually the secretary to the great Plowden Committee uh, on uh, Primary Education, which, of course, is a, a hugely iconic document uh, for progressives and also in terms of traditionalists, the, the, the view that that was a, a very dangerous document. So Morris had been secretary of that commission. Uh, and again, I've only had to can only pull out a few points here. There's a bit more in the paper. Um, uh, he made the key point that controlled by the institution of its own work, and he was talking about schools, colleges, and universities, is a leading assumption of British educational governance. That's a quote, leading assumption of British educational governance. Uh, and, and I've put this in terms of a modern metaphor about DNA, autonomy, it, it, it's like autonomy is built into the system's DNA. So autonomy is absolutely there, according to Morris Kogan. Uh, and it's interesting that in 2002, in a, a very interesting paper, uh, he revisited that uh, theme, and he made the point that schools had in the 1970s been the freest anywhere to make their curricula, but that now, i.e. in 2002, uh, we were involved, we had a, a compliance society, as he put it, controlled by a remotely accountable technocratic centre. So he saw that, in his view, there had been uh, that enormous change in that period of 27 years. And I'm going to come back later on to uh, another part of that particular paper. Uh, another speaker, so we're whizzing through the, the speakers here in 1975. The next one was another practitioner. Uh, this was Anita Ellis, who was deputy head of a comprehensive school in Bristol. Uh, and a, a council member of this society. And uh, one of her points, a key point, was that secondary heads and staff had much more autonomy in this country, in her view, than their counterparts in the USA or France, uh, but they didn't want to admit it for fear of bringing on fresh accountability measures. Um, and uh, 
She also said that, in her view, there was accountability of teachers and schools, but they were ma based mainly on exam results. So maybe that's something that hasn't changed very much. Certainly it's something that the CBI, in their report this week, uh, would concur with. Um, so a quick summing up uh, of that uh, um, conference in, in 75. Um, the conclusion of the proceedings said that nobody at the conference thought that there was something wrong with accountability or that, the, or that uh, school staff uh, shouldn't be accountable, uh, but that it was really important to avoid reductionism and the spurious objectivity that's associated with the scientific management tradition because that diminishes personal judgment and autonomy. Um, and reading through those proceedings, one got no sense at all that professional institutional autonomy was perceived by the people present as being unduly constrained. Um, but, and this was uh, an interesting thing, the proceedings did allude to this, that institutions were beginning to come to terms with a measure, a measure of external prescription. So the reform trajectory, 1975 to 2012, how long have we got? <laughs> <laughs> Come, um, uh, 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 an, hour a year, an hour for each year, do you think? Um, I, I can only pull out a few salient points, and they're points that are salient to me. Whether they're salient to you or not, of course, you, you'll need to judge. Um, it has struck me uh, that the discourse and prescriptions of right-wing commentators in the late 60s and the 70s and the 80s later became mainstream in England, but not in Scotland and Wales, very strikingly not in Scotland and Wales. On the whole, these are obviously grand, grand over, overarching sort of statements. Uh, and the, the, some of the examples are the, the reference to uh, the language of standards in the black papers of the late 60s and, and the 1970s, the emphasis on choice, diversity, and competition from the no-turning back group of conservative members of parliament in, published in 1985, and from Sheila Lawler, who's still an active commentator, um, her pamphlet for one of the think tanks, Away with LEAs, very resonant kind of title there. You didn't need to read it, you can tell exactly what, what it uh, was pro uh, propounding uh, there. And it, what was interesting in, to me in terms of saying that this is now, or seems to have become mainstream over quite over recent years, is that there's this phrase, the education establishment, the Prime Minister used it in his speech to the Conservative Conference uh, this year. Who are the educational establishment? Is it the people who are usually regarded as the education establishment, or is it the people who hold a set of views uh, in, those, in those documents? Um, now we'll go on to the year of the Education Reform Act, whizzing through very quickly, uh, the ERA 1988. Uh, and I particularly want to focus on The Self-Managing School and that extremely influential book by Brian Caldwell and Jim Spinks, two Australians, um, which actually was probably the closest thing to an international bestseller uh, that we've had in our field. I don't know if there are other contenders, maybe there are, um, but that was a very, uh, a very influential book and swept through. And it was quite interesting that that seemed to support the autonomy emphasis in the ERA. But what's been very rarely noticed about that book, actually, is that almost all of its focus was on school effectiveness, and there's practically nothing in it about the choice and competition emphasis that was so strong in, in, in the Education Reform Act, as well as the school effectiveness emphasis. And I think that's quite an important thing. And if we then take, go forward to 2008, and see Brian Caldwell's paper in the 20th anniversary of ERA issue of our journal, uh, the Educational Management Administration and Leadership, in there he wrote, as he's written elsewhere, that in his view, the claims for autonomy of the advocates of autonomy in that period had actually been extravagant. I possibly, I don't know how far he, uh, he was always quite guarded, actually, but maybe he included himself as well in that. And in his view, there was no clear research link uh, between autonomy and the outcome, and educational outcomes, so that, that that sort of link had not been uncovered. Now I'm going to go to a mid-90s, and I'm going to take Simon Jenkins, who, of course, a very influential figure currently, uh, former editor of The Times, a columnist in the um, London Evening Standard and The Guardian, um, and the chair of the National Trust, 
not many people actually know that it is the early part of his career, he was actually in our field. Um, that uh, when I arrived at the Institute in uh, about ni in 1968, uh, I learned that there was this young chap he's, who was no longer there, who was actually been George Barron, my, my boss's um, research assistant. I don't know if you realize that, David, you look as if you're nodding, um, uh, for a period of time. And I think he was working on their res the research that, that George and D.A. Howell was doing on, were doing on, on school managers and governors. Um, but in, uh, I didn't meet him at that time. I've met him briefly since and talked about that, that particular period. Um, slightly a divergence, I'm afraid, but he produced, of course, he enormously productive in, in, and prolific at any rate, and he produced this book in 1995, Accountable to None, the Tory Nationalisation of Britain, which covered other fields as well as education, but he it certainly included education. And his argument there was that what was going on seven years after the ERA was not decentralisation and greater diversity, but actually nationalisation and more uniformity. And it's interesting that that emphasis on uniformity was actually confirmed in the research that uh, Phil Woods, Carl Bagley and I did, uh, which was a CS ESRC study, the Parental and School Choice Interaction Study, in the 90s, that it did appear from, from that study that schools were actually not becoming more different, but they were actually becoming more similar. And his other quote there, the Thatcher and Major government centralised power over the content and organisation of education in a way that seemed the antithesis of everything for which the Conservatives traditionally stood. Uh, quickly, some views of the noughties. Um, Jeff Whitty, writing in that same issue of, um, uh, of email, the 20th anniversary issue, said, New Labour seems to have gone further down the market route and much further down the privatis privatisation route than the Conservatives ever achieved, as well as increasing central steerage of the system. Um, and Alan Smithers, who I believe is there, I've never met before, delighted to see you. And this is a quote in the, in the press, and I do hope it's accurate, but you can tell us later if it isn't, is from The Independent. Um, you, you're alleged to have said, this is a licorice all sorts kind of system, whereas all children should have an equal chance of a decent education. Um, uh, but what's uh, interesting... An aspect of the noughties that's rarely mentioned um, is that the British Social Attitudes Survey, uh, the one that came out in 2010, uh, found that public satisfaction with state secondary education actually rose sharply between 1997 and 2008, which I think is quite interesting. Looking at things from where we are now, um, I, I believe there's a kind of modern paradox. Um, despite the emphasis on autonomy, uh, in my judgment, most school practitioners feel more constrained now than their 1975 forebears actually did. Um, there's been cons continuous structural change, but very variable performance, especially in regard to equity. Uh, and the effect of socioeconomic background uh, is, in this country, is well above the OECD average. There's an alarming uh, bit of data from, from uh, the last PISA. Uh, which is that um, if you relate a school's intake to its performance, that relationship is stronger in the UK than in any other of 33 uh, OECD countries, except for some bizarre reason, little Luxembourg. Um, and actually, if you add another 30 countries, which are the partner countries, which are not members of the OECD but still take part in PISA, we're still one from bottom. Uh, and that's really quite, you know, extremely alarming, it seems to me. Um, <coughs> another OECD study of leadership development should be well known to, to many of you from 2008, discussed autonomy. And they actually said that autonomy did have some beneficial effects. I'll say a bit more about that in a moment. Uh, but there was this danger of role overload, that what you absolutely need to have, and this problem of dis potential distraction into other areas beyond te focusing on teaching and learning, that needs to be countered. And also, you desperately need strong support systems in terms of training, development, support, advice, and all the other kinds of things that, for example, you had in the London Challenge, to give one example. Um, and the last PISA uh, said, yes, curricular autonomy, which is a thing we haven't had on the whole over the, you know, quite a long period of time, um, that has beneficial effects in terms of performance, but in relation to staffing and finance, the results are much more mixed. And that, that doesn't surprise me. I haven't got time to talk about that, but I think that's something that is worth exploring further. 
Um, I, in my view, autonomy is a subtle and a relative concept. Leaders gain, yes, they gain more autonomy, but do staff or learners? And there's an interesting study done here at Birmingham University uh, in the late 90s by Alison Bullock and, uh, and Harold Thomas, uh, which looked at that in 11 countries. And it ca came out that there were benefits for leaders in terms of, of that, but staff often felt more insecure because of their jobs, and there was no clear link to improved learning uh, achievement. Uh, and as they, they said, um, as so often with change, the benefits for one group can create problems for others. And so for me, the issue is autonomy over what and for whom, and that's a key question about it. I'm going to go through very quickly on this uh, issue of change because so much has been written about it recently. I think there are big governance issues about that, particularly the larger chains. And th this is uh, a quote from me. Uh, schools in chains are not independent, they just have different masters. Uh, but the, it does raise, it seems to me, fundamental questions about the ownership of publicly provided assets. The key issue, to whom do and should schools funded by the public purse belong? And I know we've got another event coming up in the spring on that, and that'll be extremely interesting. There has been, there have been some, there's been some uh, polling on the related issue, not of ownership, but of provision. What do the, who do the public think ought to provide schools and schooling? And there was one, for example, by uh, Ipsos Mori for the Charity Commission in 2010, which found that if they said, who would, be, who would you think would be best able to manage schooling? 2% uh, said charities, 8% said private companies, 73% said public authorities, and 15% said it would make no difference. Um, now, I think that why has there been all this rhetoric of autonomy despite uh, the increased centralization, which is clear and evident, and the development of chains? Why? And it seems to me there are three reasons, and we're going to whip through it very quickly. Uh, firstly, the commitment to free market ideology. Secondly, the particular nature of the English Constitution. And thirdly, the symbolic power uh, of the elite independent school sector. I'm not going to talk about the first one, because so much has been done by uh, so many people, Stephen Ball and many others on that, but I am going to focus on the other two because I don't think so much attention has been given to them. The impact of the Constitution, we've had serial breathless restructuring over the last quarter of a century in many public services, but particularly in education and health, and it's very much continuing in both areas. I very much, my, almost my Bible on this is a wonderful paper that the political scientist Christopher Pollitt wrote in 2007, uh, where he reviewed a lot of different uh, uh, systems and, and public management reform in many different countries. And he, his conclusion was that the UK had been the most activist, hard-driving of comparable countries in relation to public management reform. And he put the reason for this, he, he felt, was that there was an absence of constraints within the constitutional setup. Uh, there's no federal structure. The, uh, the, 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 the relationship between the uh, executive and the legislature is too close, there's not enough separation between the two. Um, uh, local government doesn't have any protection, uh, there aren't proportional voting systems. And he, this very memorable quote, the British system maximizes the temptation to reorganize, but minimizes the political penalties for doing so. And he also said the, the, there's so many reforms that cascade one after the other, that each one of them is actually hard to evaluate. But in his view, there'd been no real evidence of benefit from them, and the costs were very much unacknowledged. Both the, the tangible costs, but also the intangible costs of disruption, distraction, loss of organizational memory, and so on. And he branded all that the dark side of reform, and I do think there is, a, there is that dark side which needs to be taken into account. The private school sector, um, I think that's been a buried issue, but it's becoming un less, less and less buried now. There's much more discussion about it, certainly in the last two or three years than previously. The resource differences are well known. I think uh, private, the private school sector overall has twice as many teachers as the state school sector for their number of pupils. The classes are half the size. Uh, fees uh, are up to three times the per pupil spend in state schools. The differences are much starker here than between public and private in most other comparable countries. And yet state schools, and this is very little known, certainly according to PISA, state schools perform much better in this country once the social intake is accounted for. And in fact, the gap 
<coughs> in favour of state schools is much greater than it is in, in other countries. In other countries, the, the average is that, it's slight, that state schools are slightly ahead of private schools. In this country, it's very stark. Uh, and again, that's very rarely included in public debate. Uh, but, oh, golly. <laughs> the extensive, there's extensive reach, as we know, into top jobs. Uh, we've got a unique national experience which other countries don't share. And that's where I think the attraction of the independent state school concept has come from and the notion of mimicking elite school structures, um, which the academies program, for example, seems to me to be a, a, a classic example of. But I think their DNA, to use uh, Andrew O'Donis's phrase, is very much unproven. Quickly on to accountability. I think I can just about do it. Uh, back to Maurice Kogan's uh, paper of 2002. He talks about the enormous superstructure of monitoring and control. Um, and he talks about the practitioner's hot knowledge every day. Um, which and contrasts that with what he calls the decontextualized and cold knowledge in performance indicators. And he thinks that practitioners have a big problem relating those two together. Um, uh, Honora O'Neill, a uh, distinguished philosopher, gave a, a very influential set of wreath lectures in 2002 as well, uh, which he talked about the new accountability structure providing incentives for arbitrary and unprofessional choices. Uh, and that we need a system that will enable staff to serve the public rather than their paymasters. And thirdly, I don't know if John Dunford's arrived. Um, uh, pardon? Not yet. Not yet, but he will recall that uh, the Secretary Heads Association published a very interesting and important document towards intelligent accountability for schools based on Honora O'Neill's uh, lectures in 2003. And I'd be interested to know whether he feels what sort of Im uh, impact that had. Uh, accountability in question, heavily prescriptive approaches uh, tend not to be linked to high performance internationally. That was a McKinsey study in, in 2010 indicated that. And if you read Parsi Salberg's uh, wonderful book, Finnish Lessons, uh, you'll get uh, more of an understanding about that in relation to Finland. Um, also, there's this worry about the heightened emphasis on traditional academic programs, which we've had in the last couple of years particularly, may further disadvantage the forgotten half of school students who don't go to university. And that's, that there have been a couple of very interesting think tank reports recently, one called the forgotten half for Demos in 2011, and one called um, a, a long division for the Institute of public policy research very recently, and it has been a long division because next year is the 50th anniversary of what, a, a, a report which had a profound effect on me uh, uh, in, in you know, the earlier period, uh, which was the Newsom report, which focused on, it was called Half Our Future, and talked about the terrible shame of the waste of talent uh, about that 50%, and I'm afraid that's very much still with us, so it has been a long division. Conclusions. Three slides of doing, I think I can just about do it. Um, it seems to me, have things changed? The more they change, the more, well, my view is that the language is now similar to 1975, but I think the framework has changed almost beyond recognition. And just a couple of pointers to that. Schools now have far more responsibilities, and the centre has changed, and this is my uh, interpretation of it, from a trusting referee and resource provider to a demanding and impatient managing director with frequently changing identity and priorities. Um, and that does reflect some global trends. There's a phrase, decentralized centralism, which one writer, a uh, Scandinavian writer, has used, which I think is, is quite an accurate phrase. But there are also distinctive features, and perhaps the most evident is disempowerment of local authorities. Because in, in some countries, actually, the, the de decentralization has been to that level, rather than you know, for them to be disempowered. Uh, so I have a, this is the looking forward bit. So can it work? And if so, with what effects? Now, we're a country of more than 50 million people. We're apparently going to become 70 million quite soon. Uh, and the plan seems to be to have just two layers of governance, the school in the local competitive market, and then the central government as the sole political authority. Now, that's definitely an untried and audacious framework to, to put forward. And if it succeeds, I'm sure it will be hugely influential uh, internationally um, and will probably be copied quite widely. To me, I have to say it looks unstable. I think it could lead to an even more 
complex and variable patchwork of provision, and of provision that we have now. Somebody at a meeting I was at um, a while ago talked about it being like the Wild West out there, and I thought that was quite a good phrase. And it's certainly the opposite of the whole system approach which has been successfully used elsewhere. And here I refer you to another article in that email issue of 2008 by Ben Levin and Michael Fullan, the Canadians who've put forward this view elsewhere as well, saying that that is actually the way forward. And some of our experiences in the London challenge and the city challenges, I think, points in that direction as well. And it's interesting that the CBI report issued earlier this week used the same phrase, phrase there as well. So there's a question about democratic legitimacy, of course, as well. And it's interesting that Lord Baker, Ken Baker, who, of course, was so central to the ERA in 1988, uh, said in the House of Lords last year, that the government would come to realise that there was a need for intermediate bodies. So it goes round again. And finally, the wider lessons for me, um, that a fairly obvious point, that system changes like the ones we've been looking at reflect unique histories and cultures, not just international trends. And I think it's important to bear that in mind. Others have made, made that point. Mike Bottery, for example, has in his writings as well. Um, that concepts such as autonomy mean different things in different con contexts. They ob autonomy obviously means something quite different, say, in Sweden, which had no history of, uh, of independent schooling or any kind of autonomous arrangements uh, before they introduced their free schools. And in many other countries, there was far less autonomy than we were used to. Um, so autonomy means different, very different things, and we have to watch that terminology. We need, I believe, comparative research on ideas of autonomy and accountability. For example, within different types of traditions, such as the more individualistic traditions in the States and here, and the more collective activists, such as the ones in continental Europe and some parts of Asia as well. Uh, as Hughes and Richards said in 1975, we need to understand those concepts, quote, in regard to specific organizational settings. Um, and finally, leadership research for me um, seems to be sometimes too generic, and I think we need to move away from that. I think it needs to fully reflect the specific context of policy and governance in which it's exercised. And one of the most encouraging things for me in the last few years is the way Belmas in particular, but others also, have started to recognize this. And I think this event and some of the others that Belmas is putting on currently um, is, is a, a very important indication of that. Thank you very much.